Yeah, so it has started recording and uh, let me also get my PDF file. Yes, so uh, yeah, today is 29th, right? Yes. yes. So, okay, good. Uh, so what did we do last time on Friday? We started chapter three and uh, we did this inequalities, right? What were the three inequalities that we did? Jensen and Mikoski and, 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 and uh, Holder. What was the order in which we did it? Jensen, Holder and Mikoski. And Minkowski. And Jensen was, uh, what was the statement of Jensen? It was about uh, convex functions. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. it had the form, so you have a measurable function f and uh, you can take the integral of f which is valued in some interval a, b, and uh, you have a convex function defined on that interval. And uh, phi composed f you can consider, f you can consider, you can integrate both. And what was the inequality? Phi of integral a is an integral of phi of. Less than or equal to. What was the condition on the measure space? Uh, yeah. Full set. Hmm? Measure of whole set should be one. Measure of whole set is one, yes. And what was the key idea in the proof? The key idea was this uh, alternate uh, definition for convexity, right? In terms of those uh, differential quotients, right? right? And uh, we wrote it in two ways and we took, uh, we got some inequality and you had to integrate that inequality and uh, then you will get the result. And I said that GM less than or equal to AM is a particular case of this inequality. Did you check that? Yes, sir. Okay, it's there in yes. Rudin. And uh, then we did Holder, which said that uh, one norm of FG is less than or equal to P norm of F times Q norm of G when P and Q are conjugates. Right? 1 by P plus 1 by Q is 1. And what was the main uh, idea here? You use convexity of exponential function. Convexity of exponential function and one or two tricks, and uh, that was also not very difficult. And Minkowski straight away follows from Holder, right? It's just a trick writing f plus g power p as f plus g times f plus g power p minus one, something like that, right? Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Minkowski also followed. Okay, so let's continue from here. Today also we won't do much. Let me start sharing the screen. And one of you, please confirm that you can see this. Yes, it's visible. Okay, so we will do LP spaces. And uh, last time we did this inequalities. And we just recalled they are all EC. And uh, today we will discuss LP spaces. So uh, we have already, you already know the P norm. We have defined it. So in general, you have a measure space X M mu. Mu is a positive measure and F is a measurable function. So when we did uh, these uh, uh, inequalities, we took F and G to be uh, positive valued functions, right? Now we are taking complex functions and we are going to define uh, for P, which is not infinity, the p norm to be integral mod f power p. Earlier we wrote integral f power p because f was anyway positive. So integral mod f power p power 1 by p. And uh, we will also treat the case p equal to infinity. What is the definition? Do you remember the infinity norm? What is the key word? Super norm. Uh, do you just remember or uh, there's one more word? That's <laughs> It's called the essential supremum. You know, on a set of measure zero, you don't care what happens. Yes. Sir. OK, so let's define it. So the infinity norm is the essential supremum of mod f. So what is essential supremum? So suppose you have a positive measurable function and you consider all those real numbers where uh, the set where Gx is bigger than alpha, that is measure zero. Is the definition of this set clear? So take those real numbers 
which have the property that when z takes values above that real number, such x has measure zero. Okay, mu of z inverse of alpha infinity is zero. And then define beta to be, if, if this set is empty, you define beta to be infinity. Otherwise, you take the infimum of this set. So what, what, what actually is happening? If there is a point beyond which values are taken only on a measure zero set, then you ask whether is there a lower point like that, right? You take the least such point, okay, the greatest lower bound. So what is the property? If, if you take any number bigger than beta, then beyond that, the value is taken only on a measure zero set, right? Yes. So, so it is, it is the supremum essentially, meaning the points, the, 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 the points where value is bigger than this is of measure zero. It's ignorable. OK, this is the notion of essential supremum. And uh, in fact, you can uh, conclude a bit more that this beta itself belongs to S. Beta is the infimum, right? In general, infimum of a set need not be part of that set. But in this case, beta belongs to S. So here is a proof. So if you take epsilon positive, then if you take alpha, so beta is the greatest lower bound, right? So beta plus something is not a lower bound. That means there is alpha less than beta plus epsilon such that what will happen? Such that, so this is not a lower bound. So there is an alpha like this belonging to S, right? Agree? Beta plus epsilon is not a lower bound for that set, right? Because beta is the greatest lower bound. Yes. So that means there is an alpha in S which is less than this. So alpha in S means mu of x in x is that gx bigger than alpha is zero. Agree? Yes. Yeah. So in particular, this is also zero. Because uh, this set is contained in that set, right? If gx is bigger than beta plus epsilon, then gx is bigger than alpha, right? This set yes. is a subset of this set, and this set has measure zero. Therefore, this is measure zero. Why? <coughs> Why? Why is uh, subset is having measure zero? This is measurable and contained in the content in yeah. set of It is measurable. That is why. Okay, there is no completeness or anything. But uh, this is measurable because G is measurable and then you have monotonicity. OK, so if you have a set of measure zero, if you take a subset, there are only two possibilities. Either that subset is not measurable or it has measure zero. So in this case, because G is measurable, it is measurable, therefore measure zero. So that means now you observe that G inverse of beta infinity is union of G inverse of beta plus one by n infinity. And uh, beta plus one by n, you can take epsilon to be one by n. So what is measure of this set? Zero, right? Right? Yes. 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 And uh, because it is a measure, measure of this set is union of all these things, right? I mean, less than or equal to union of all these things. So this also has measure zero. Clear? Uh, that means beta itself belongs to S by the definition of S. So the essential supremum belongs to this set. OK, that's good to remember. So it follows that beta belongs to S and we define LP spaces to be all those F such that the P norm of F is finite. P can be infinity also. And uh, if it is infinity, you say that such a function is essentially bounded. Function need not be bounded. It may take infinity also, but it is essentially bounded. OK, so unbounded part is of measure zero. And you can also see that mod fx less than or equal to lambda for almost all x, if and only if lambda is bigger than or equal to the essential supremum. You see this? So if lambda is bigger than the essential supremum, then by our definition, mod fx bigger than lambda, that will have measure zero. So that means mod fx is less than or equal to lambda for almost all x and the other way also, right? So, uh, so this property also keep in mind that uh, almost all x mod fx is less than or equal to lambda, uh, if and only if lambda is bigger than the essential supremum. 
and uh, one small check which I don't do, you do it, is that Holder and Minkowski we proved assuming P is strictly between one and infinity, right? Uh, yes. We proved it F positive, but uh, we proved it for F positive, but uh, uh, with uh, anyway, in our definition, mod F is there, which is positive. Therefore, we have proved mod F, uh, Holder and Minkowski, for complex measurable functions, provided P is not 1 and P is not infinity. You agree? Yes, between 1 and infinity. Now, P equal to 1 and infinity is trivial. It's very easy to check. Okay. Inequalities will be automatically true. Uh, very easily true. So, you please check that. It's just a quick check. So, Holder and Minkowski, we, we have for LP spaces for all P. Okay. And uh, you define a metric on this space. So is LP space a vector space? If F and G are LP, F plus G is LP? Yes. Why? Because of Minkowski. Minkowski. Because of Minkowski, right? Because of Minkowski. And uh, alpha F is anyway LP. So it's a vector space, no doubt about it. And uh, we are going to check is it a metric space, OK? It is a metric space except for a small problem. So you can define DFG to be, is it a non-linear space you can ask? Is it a non-linear space LP mu with this P norm? The question is, is P norm a norm? What do you say? So this is the definition. Is this a norm? So triangle inequality we have proved, right? Minkowski's inequality. So that is okay. Norm of alpha f, if alpha is a scalar, mod alpha comes out. No, no problem, right? Because here it will yes. be alpha f, so mod, mod alpha power p, power 1 by p. So mod alpha will come out, no problem. What is the other thing to check? If f is 0, then of course norm is 0. That is okay. What is the last thing to check? If norm f is 0, is f 0? Is that true? Yes. yes. Why? That is not true for... This that is, is not right because what you get is integral of mod f power p is zero if integral of a function is zero a positive function is zero what is the conclusion f is zero almost everywhere yes so you can conclude that uh, if norm f p is zero then f is zero almost everywhere it need not be zero for that uh, small reason it's not quite a norm so if you define this to be a metric it's not quite a metric except that dfg zero implies f equal to g almost everywhere so what do you do in order to get a nonlinear space, you consider this modulo and equivalence. You define this to be the equivalence relation. F is equivalent to G if F equal to G almost everywhere. And uh, then you define on those equivalence classes, you define this metric. Okay, on those equivalence classes, you define this metric D of mod F. I mean the bracket F bracket G equivalence class of F equivalence class of G is D of F G. This is well defined. You need to check that. You can easily check. This is well defined. If you take something else from the equivalence class, right? If you take F prime uh, from the equivalence class of F, then F prime and F are same almost everywhere. So if you take, uh, yeah, this is a small check to me. Okay, so check that. So uh, it is with respect to this equivalence class. Now, from now onwards, LP means we are considering equivalence class of uh, these functions. OK, and as Rudin says, you know, we will not make a fuss about it. We will think about it as functions only. Keep it in mind that it's an equivalence class. Everything is almost everywhere. OK, now the main result is the most important result about these LP spaces is it is complete. OK, do you remember the proof? You must have done this already. What is the main idea? So we are going to do for uh, P not equal to infinity, P equal to infinity is even easier. Okay, that we will do at the end. If you recall uh, some of the important points, it's good. Otherwise, it's going to come in the slides. Does anyone uh, remember? Uh, you have done this, no? LP is complete. It's a Bonnard space, yes. right? Complete nonlinear space. What is the main idea? It's not a difficult proof, but there are one or two ideas. 
first we have to uh, construct a subsequent. Yes. So first of all, you have to show it's complete. So what do you have to show? Take a Cauchy sequence and show that it has a convergent subsequence. Show that it converges, right? Every Cauchy sequence converges, no? Yes, sir. Then it completes. Not to show this subsequence. Yeah, it's complete. You have to show that it converges. Converges in what norm? What metric? LP. LP. Converges in? P norm. P norm. In the LP metric. Okay. In the LP metric, it converges. So, what is the main idea? From cautiousness, you are going to construct a subsequence. So if Fn's are your sequence, you are going to construct a subsequence Fn1, Fn2, etc. With what property? The successive things, the differences, very small. So you will take 1 by 2 power n or something, right? Yes. Fn, Fn i plus 1 minus Fn i modulus is less than 1 by 2 power i, something like that. Then what is the idea? So you have got some good bound on these differences. And therefore, you can take some of these differences, right? This is modulus. You take sum of modulus of Fn plus i, Fn i plus 1 minus Fn i. Yes? What, what do you know about yes. that? That converges, right? That sum is convergent. Why? That's because it is bounded by 1 by 2 power i and summation 1 by 2 power i converges. Yes? yes. So this gives you an a nice way of constructing a function. You can take Fn plus i, Fn i plus 1 minus Fn i and take summation. That summation is absolutely convergent, right? After putting mod, you have showed its convergence. Yeah? So, yes. Okay, yes. you haven't quite shown its... Uh, No, what you have shown is, what you have shown is summation. Yeah, there's, there's a little bit of work to be done in order to show that that function makes sense. Okay, that sum makes sense. If you know that that sum makes sense, you have got a candidate. Right, because what is that sum? That sum is limit of its partial sums, no? Yes. yes. And therefore you have got, you know, uh, a candidate function and uh, now you have to show that that function is the limit of so you have got a candidate and by this construction you have to do, use a little bit of measure theory to do that which we will do and once you get the candidate what is the claim this is actually the limit of the original sequence in the LP norm okay so let's do this so you have got a Cauchy sequence Fn and as you said, so that means uh, for any epsilon there is an n, n depends on epsilon, no? Yes. Right? And depending on epsilon such that if m and n are bigger than that, then mod Fn minus Fn is less than epsilon. That means you can choose these ni's. So for example, you can take any ni bigger than n corresponding to 1 by 2 power i with n1 less than n2 less than etc. so that this is less than 1 by 2 power i. Agree? Like that you can construct this subsequence. Okay. Now what we are going to do is we are going to take a finite sum of this. So up to k of modulus of this if you call gk. Yes. You could also have to, so I'm, I'm interested in limit of gk as k goes to infinity. What is limit of GK as K goes to infinity? Summation I going from 1 to infinity modulus of this, right? Agree? Yes. 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 Mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That is the mistake I made earlier. This, that I would like to show is convergent. That we have no idea, no? Because what is given is this norm is less than 1 by 2 power i, not modulus, right? So, right, so verbally I made a mistake, no? I said all this is less than 1 by 2 power i and summation 1 by 2 power i is 
finite and therefore this converges. That is not quite true, right? Because you don't know about this modulus. What you know is about the P norm, okay? So that can be fixed using uh, what we know. So GK is this and limit GK is summation one to infinity modulus of FNI plus one minus FNI. And I would like to say that that infinite sum makes sense. That is the first step, that infinite sum makes sense. How do you do that? So the point is, uh, this you know, the P norm of GK is less than one. Why is that? Minkowski inequality. And by Minkowski, because the P norm of GK is by triangle inequality many times, the P norm of all these things. So that is summation one by two power i, which is less than one. Okay, finite sum one by two power i, which is less than one. So this you know. Now what you do is you consider GK power P and apply Fatos lemma. Okay, so when you apply Fatos lemma, what is Fatos lemma? Integral of lim minf is less than or equal to? Lim minf of, lim minf of the integral and uh, you are going to apply it for GK power P. Integral of GK power P is less than one, right? Yes. Because that is exactly this condition. Integral of GK power P, whole power one by P is less than one. So integral of GK power P is less than one. So by Fatou's lemma, integral of limit is same as limit, right? Well, uh, that is not quite true, no? I should write limit only, right? I should write limit, no? I should write limit because uh, no limit also I can uh, write if I include infinity, right? That's okay, no? Infinity is allowed, right? As the function value. Yeah, that's okay. So I can take limit. Limit GK is summation one to infinity of modulus of this, right? Right now, you know, it could be infinity. I don't care. Include infinity. Okay. So GKs are positive functions, which means infinity is allowed. Zero to infinity. So integral of limit GK power P is less than or equal to limit of integral GK power P. Agree? That is Fatou's lemma. And uh, for each K, this is less than one. This is strictly less than one, right? For each k, this is strictly less than one. By Minkowski, we showed that, right? Yes. And therefore, limit is less than one. So this is less than one. And uh, therefore, for uh, g, g is nothing but lim gk. Okay, so if you consider integral of g power p, you get that norm g is less than or equal to one. Is this step okay? The idea is this is less than one for each k. This is less than one for each k because of Minkowski and therefore the limit is less than one. So therefore this is nothing but g. If, if you take g to be this, this is g power p, right? So norm g power p is less than or equal to one. So norm g is less than or equal to one. Is that okay? Yes, sir. So it's an application of Fatou's lemma. So if you take G to be this, then norm G is less than or equal to one. And in particular, this tells you that uh, G makes sense. No, G is finite, right? Almost everywhere, right? Integral of G power P is finite. Yeah, if integral of G power P is finite, uh, then uh, G cannot be infinity on a non-measure zero set, no? If G is infinity on a non-measure zero set, then integral G power P will be infinity, right? Yes. Therefore, from this you can conclude that this summation is finite almost everywhere. Agree? Yes. FNI plus one X minus FNI of X. That is finite almost everywhere. So GX is finite almost everywhere. 
okay and uh, therefore you can take this sum so i have taken the sum without the modulus without the modulus and uh, you know that this sum is absolutely convergent almost everywhere right that is exactly gx is finite almost everywhere so this is absolutely convergent almost everywhere so almost everywhere this converges no absolute convergence is more than convergence right yes, yes. okay and what are the partial sums of this sum what is the second partial sum fn1 plus fn2 minus fn1 so that is fn2 what is the third partial sum Hmm? What is the third partial sum? Fn plus 2. Fn i. Yeah. Fn3, Fn right? So Fn1 is the first partial sum. Fn2 is the second partial sum. Third is Fn3, no? Yes. You will get Fn3 plus. You will get Fn1 plus Fn2 minus Fn1 plus Fn3 minus Fn2. Everything cancels and you will get Fn3. Okay, yes. so the partial sums are precisely Fnk. And this converges almost everywhere. So what is the conclusion? Conclusion is that limit Fnk exists as k goes to infinity almost everywhere. Right? Yes. OK, so you can define a function f to be whenever this is convergent, which is almost everywhere, you would take that and otherwise you would take it to be zero. So take this function f and then do you agree that fs limit fni i goes to infinity almost everywhere because that's fni is precisely the ith partial sum here yes okay so you have constructed a function f and the claim is that this f is the limit of that cauchy sequence that you started with okay so you have got a point wise limit almost everywhere of the subsequence and this subsequential limit is the LP limit. That is the claim. OK, so let us do that. We claim that F is the LP limit of Fn. And uh, how does one do that? Again, Fatos lemma. OK, so you take now take the now no subsequence. Take the original sequence Fm and take integral of mod F minus Fm power P d mu. That is less than or equal to limit of Fni minus Fm power P d mu, right? Because limit of Fni is F. Okay, limit of Fni yes. is F from the previous slide. So this is Fatou's lemma. And uh, Fni minus Fm power P, so given any epsilon beyond a stage, Fm minus Fn is less than epsilon, no? Because what is given to us is a Cauchy sequence, right? Cost. Yeah, so uh, what is given to us is a Cauchy sequence in the P norm, right? Cauchy sequence in the P norm. So what you know is norm P norm of Fn minus Fm is less than epsilon. That means integral mod Fn minus Fm power P is less than epsilon power P beyond a stage. If Ni and M are beyond that stage, then this is true, right? Right? Yes. If Ni and M are big enough, then this is true. Therefore, Liminf, this is true, no? If after stage this is true, then for Liminf, this is true. It's a lower limit. Okay, so this you have and uh, beyond a stage. For M beyond that stage. Correct? Because Liminf is only over I. So when Ni and M are bigger than a stage, this is true and you are taking limit over Ni. So when M bigger than this, this is true. OK, so what is the conclusion from this? Conclusion from this is that F minus Fm belongs to. The P norm of F minus Fm is finite, right? By this application of Fatou's lemma, you have concluded that F minus Fm belongs to LP. Agree with this? Yes. OK, and but therefore can you sir, conclude that F belongs to LP? Sir, this is true for only M greater than equal to N epsilon. Yes, yes. For large enough M, F minus Fm is an LP. Yes. OK, so take M large enough. 
take m large enough so that f minus f m is in LP. So we have to write sir here m is greater than equal to m. Yeah, it is for this m. Yes. The, it's for some larger. Yeah, f minus f m is in LP for m large enough. Yes. Okay. Here so, we can write uh, in particular for some and so. Yeah, in particular for some m f minus f m is in LP. Mm -hmm. That's the meaning. Okay. Yes. But I'm yes. not bothered about f m, so I don't care. I will write f as f minus f m plus f m. All these f m's are from LP anyway. No, it's a Cauchy sequence in LP, right? Whatever that yes. m is, f s f minus f m plus f m. LP is a vector space, no? So yes. f is in LP. Okay, so f is in LP, f m is in LP, and what is happening? Norm of f minus f m, p norm of f minus f m can be made as small as you want, right? Yes. That's what this inequality is saying. So that means p norm of f minus f m goes to zero as m goes to infinity. This is what you had to show, no? Yes. So this is uh, the point. And uh, you know, there is a corollary to this proof, if you observe, which is that suppose it is given to you that you have a convergent sequence in LP. There is a sequence FM and the limit is F. The LP limit is F. The corollary to this proof is that. So you know that if limit is F, then. Uh, then. Uh, Yeah, see limit is unique, right? In any metric space, if you have a sequence, limit is unique, no? Yes. OK, so if you have a convergent sequence, in particular it is Cauchy, right? Yes. Every convergent sequence is Cauchy, right? So if you have a convergent sequence with limit F, the P norm, limit F is given to you, you just take it as Cauchy and do this proof. What will you get? When you do this proof, you will get that point wise limit, right? When you do this yes. proof, what <laughs> is given to you is a convergent sequence. In particular, it is Cauchy. And when you do this at this stage, you will get a point wise limit. Yeah. And in this proof, you are going to show that this point wise limit is the P limit. Agree? That's the structure of the proof, no? Yes. Point wise limit is the P limit, right? But P limit is already given to you because what is given is a convergent sequence. So what is the conclusion? This limit and that. Uh, yes. Limit. So the so conclusion is the following beautiful conclusion, which is that if you have a convergent sequence in LP, then uh, Fn converging to Fn LP, then Fn converges to F point wise almost everywhere. This you already know. That's part of this proof, right? Yes. If Fn converges to F in LP, then you already know that Fn converges to F point wise almost everywhere. Not everywhere, almost everywhere. Okay, this is a crucial observation which might come up later. Hmm? So convergence in P norm tells you point wise convergence almost everywhere. That follows from this proof. It's not a corollary to the completeness. It follows from this proof. OK, so this is the proof and there is this beautiful corollary also. P equal to infinity, it's much easier. OK, so Fn is a Cauchy sequence in L infinity. You define these sets. Mod Fk bigger than the infinity norm of Fk and uh, bmn to be mod fn minus fm bigger than the infinity norm and if you take e to be the union of all these sets as k varies m varies n varies what is the measure of e if fk is bigger than infinity norm of fk such x what will be the measure of ak zero and similarly measure of bmn is zero right yes going beyond the infinity norm is measure zero Right? Therefore, E has measure zero. Agree? Yes. Yes. So e has measure zero. And on the complement of E, Fn converges to a bounded function. Why is that? Yes. 
on the complement of E, Fn converges to a. So you consider the complement of E. You consider X minus E. And what do you know about Fn there? Fn's are uh, complement of E. So what is happening on the complement of E? So E is union of AK and BMN. So what is the complement of E? What sir, is the complement of e union B? Here bounded means that it's still bounded. No, I'm saying bounded. But uh, first of all, what is a complement? What is... Uh, No, claim is bounded only, not essentially bounded. So let's let's check uh, boundedness. So what is so if you have A union B two sets, what is the complement of A union B? Intersection of A complement and B complement. Intersection of that's correct, no? Yes. Yeah. So intersection of the complements. Now what is happening in the complement of AK? AK is, is uh, points where mod FK is bigger than the infinity norm. So on the complement of AK, mod FK is, FK is bounded, right? On the yes. complement of AK, FK is bounded by the infinity norm of FK, which is a finite number, right? It's a finite number because Fn belongs to L infinity. So essential supremum is finite as the definition, right? Yes, sir. So on the complement of AK, FK is bounded. So intersection of all these complements, right? So on the complement of E, each Fn is bounded. Agree? Yes. And uh, on the complement of E, each Fn is bounded and uh, each Fn is bounded and why do you get convergence? Due to B BMN, the sets BMN. Yes, due to the set BMN, but uh, how do you finish it off? So uh, it's also the complement of BMN, so you know that mod Fn minus Fm is Yes, yes, is less than mod Fn minus mod Fm, uh, no, infinity norm of Fn minus Fm, right? But it is Cauchy. So for large enough N and M, this is arbitrarily small. Right? Yes. By cautionness, yes. by the infinity norm cautionness. For large enough N and M, mod Fn minus Fm is small. And therefore, Is that enough to get convergence? So on we the complement of E, find convergence. I think. Yes, on the on the on the complement of E, what you know is yes, fix an X, uh, fix an X, and uh, you will get that uh, these are uh, this is sequence. So if you take F K X, that sequence is uh, a bounded sequence, right? On the complement of E. Right? And it is Cauchy. So how do you get point wise convergence? By the same trick that we did earlier, we can do, right? No, do we need to do that? You just have to show convergence. Once it is convergent, the limit will be bounded, no? Because each Fn is bounded, right? So limit will be bounded, that's not a problem. But how do you get convergence? Because the 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 sequence f n x will be the sequence of uh, real numbers. Yes. For fixed x. Yes. And it is Cauchy, so that's why it will be convergent. Sequence of real numbers. So what is the property that you are using? You have a From sequence here, of. It is Cauchy. Cauchy. Yes, so it yeah, so it's a, it's a, yeah, correct. So Cauchy sequence and uh, Cauchy sequence of real numbers, therefore it converges, correct? And uh, and uh, the so point wise, you have got the limit, right? Yes, point wise, you have got the limit F. 
and uh, why is f bounded as a function because each fn is bounded yes that's enough no? so you get a bounded function f and now uh, fn converges to a bounded function f and uh, you take fx to be zero almost uh, uh, for x and e okay so almost everywhere you have got this convergence and uh, why is f in l infinity mu because uh, this particular f what do you have to show uh, to show that l infinity mu it's essentially bounded so it is bounded on the complement of e right yeah that's why and uh, therefore it is uh, and it is zero anyway on e so it is bound so it's actually bounded the function f that we have defined is bounded and uh, so it's in l infinity mu and uh, the the infinity norm converges to zero and why is that because the infinity norm is what infinity norm is the essential supremum of fn minus f right but uh, fn minus f Yeah, if fn converges to f point wise, then this is automatic, no? If fn converges to f point wise, then that means fn minus f is modulus of fn minus f is arbitrarily small, right? At uh, almost every point. Yes. Right? And the infinity norm is the essential supremum of mod fn minus f. So that also goes to zero. Right. In particular, sir, here we can say uh, a pointwise convergence sequence of L infinity function to a bounded yes. function is equivalent yes. to L infinity. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what we are saying. Okay. So this shows completeness, and the same uh, thing, uh, same corollary earlier is true here also in this proof also. Right. If uh, f n converges to f in the p norm, then uh, f n converges to f. Uh, point wise almost everywhere that follows for p equal to infinity also okay so this is important completeness and uh, corollary to the proof as i said uh, if it converges with limit f then it has a subsequence which converges point wise almost everywhere to fx okay this i think we will use later okay now uh, we want to show that ccx is dense in lp mu okay and uh, do you remember what will be the crucial step in that CC excess dense in LP mu? There is one word which we have done. CC excess continuous function of compact support. LP mu is P integrable functions. In particular, they are measurable functions. So measure measurable can be approximated by continuous. What is that result? Lucent. Lucent theorem. Okay, that we will do in the next class. I haven't put it in the slides, but uh, something similar. Simple functions are dense. So you consider the class of all complex measurable simple functions with this property that uh, uh, Sx non-zero that is measure finite. Okay, the points where S is non-zero that measure is finite. Why, why am I putting this condition so that S belongs to LP, right? If this condition is there, then S belongs to LP, no? Yes. This condition has to be there, no? Otherwise, S does not belong to LP, right? Yes. Yes. If, if a non-zero value is taken at an infinite measure thing, then the product will be infinite. Okay, so under this condition, S belongs to LP, and the claim is that this class is dense in LP. Okay. So proof is easy. So S is contained in LP because of this condition. OK. Now what you do is uh, you can assume you, you take an F in LP. Take F. <laughs> so I've forgotten to write that. Take F in LP. So it's a complex function, but it's enough to do for F positive. Why? Because complex you will write as U plus IV and U you will write as U plus minus U minus etc. OK. So the proof boils down to proving it for a positive function. So we may assume F is in LP and F is positive and uh, positive functions. We had this particular construction, no? 
approximating using simple functions, right? Long back we did this. So you have simple functions such that S1 less than or equal to S2 less than or equal to etc. and Sn converges to F. Okay, so in particular Sn is less than or equal to F, no? Right? Yep. It's an increasing sequence of simple functions converging to F. So Sn is less than or equal to F, right? It's an increasing sequence of functions converging to the limit. Monotonic increasing. So Sn is less than or equal to F and therefore Sn also belongs to LP. Because F belongs to LP. Is that OK? Yes. OK, so each Sn is an LP and uh, we are going to show that Sn will converge to F in the LP now. That will do the job, no? We have to yes. show that S is dense. Uh, I have to first of all show that Sn belongs to S. Right? I will show that Sn belongs to S and Sn will converge to F in the LP now. That will show density, right? Yes, sir. Given F in LP, I have to show Sn from S converging to F in the LP norm. So why is Sn in S? Because if Sn is in LP, then Sn has to be in S, no? Because if Sn is not in S, then it cannot be in LP, right? Yes. No, no. So Sn is in LP and I have to show that Sn belongs to S. So why is that? Yes, because it's a simple function. Yeah. Because if Sn is measure of uh, such set at which Sn is defined at not equal to infinity, so less than infinity. So if uh, if Sn is zero, if Sn is zero, so I want to say that Sn belongs to S. If Sn is not in S, then Sn takes a non-zero value at an infinite uh, measure set. Measure set. In which case it cannot be in LP. Yes, right. Yes, sir. So Sn is in LP implies Sn is in S. That's correct. And uh, once again, what was the proof for this? S is contained in LP? Again, because measure of S not equal to 0 is finite. Because it is simple from. No, so that's not enough. Yeah, because of it simple, is. right? It is simple also. So for a characteristic function, a finitely many values that also is used, right? Yes. Because otherwise, so you know, you can have a finite measure set on which you know you may get a non integrable function, no, like 1 by x, yes. right? 1 by x on 0 to 1. Okay, so it is simple. So that is used here. So and yeah, so here this is easier. Sn belongs to S. And now we are going to show that Sn converges to F in the LP norm. OK, for that, observe that if you take F minus Sn power P, that is less than or equal to F power P. Because Sir, beyond the stage. What is argument that Sn belongs to LP mu? Say that again. I mean, what was your argument that Sn belongs to LP mu? This step. Because Sn is less than or equal to F. So Sn power P is yes. less than or equal to F power yes. P. So integral of Sn power P is less than or equal to integral of F power P. Yes. OK, and therefore Sn belongs to S. And now if you take F minus Sn power P is less than or equal to F power P. You agree with this? Because Sn converges to F, no? Sn converges Sn to F point one. So F minus Sn is small. Yeah, so beyond a stage, this is true. So right? This is true because Sn's are positive. So. Yeah, this is... Uh, no, F minus Sn. That is true. Sn, Sn is less than or equal to F. Yeah, so F minus Sn is F minus. Yeah, this is anyway true because F minus Sn is positive and F minus Sn will be less than or equal to F. 
this is anyway true okay so because of that you can apply dct what is dct dct says that if fns you can interchange limit and integral if every fn is dominated by an integrable function no yes sir so here f power p is an integrable function because f belongs to lp so f power p is integrable and this is your sequence as n varies this is your sequence they are all dominated by an integrable function and therefore integral of the limit is same as limit of the integral okay so by dct if you take limit of integral of f minus s and p that is integral of limit of f minus s and p but limit of f minus s n is zero because s n converges to f yeah so yes. by dct as n goes to infinity the p norm goes to zero and this is what you had to show you have given f in lp you have to find s n and s converging to f in the p norm and that's what you have shown so here you have assumed uh, that uh, p is finite right in this proof you have assumed that p is finite agree because you are using you know integrability and all that but p equal to infinity it's even easier so supply a proof when p equal to infinity also that s is dense in lp okay so that i will leave for you to check i will just add a line asking you to check okay so now what we have to do is uh, ccx is dense and there it is important that uh, p is not infinity okay in l infinity the completion of ccx is not ccx is not dense in l infinity the completion is something else okay so one or two small things we have to do in this chapter and egeros theorem comes as an exercise which one of you will do right yeah when yeah. we uh, have the assignments one of you will do that and okay so this is a small chapter a little bit remaining which we will do on friday and uh, yeah so let me stop sharing and uh, uh, were there typos uh, today let me also stop recording